Let's continue with the design of uh, a stabilized finite element methods that will lead us to the uh, variational multiscale framework that is uh, essentially what we will use um, in the applications. Okay, so, so far we have seen the uh, instability problems of the Galerkin method applied to the convection diffusion equation. Remember that uh, the problem is that when diffusion is very small, we do not have control on the derivatives, and, um, and the estimates, the usual estimates in H1 simply fail. And on the other hand, for the Stokes problem, we don't have control on the pressure. Okay? So we have seen that in order to stabilize the problems for convection dominated flows, the possibility or one, the, the natural choice was to introduce somehow diffusion, somehow. First uh, everywhere, then in the direction of the streamlines, and finally in a consistent manner by perturbing the test function of the equations. Okay? Let's see what happens for the Stokes problem. In principle, it's another problem, and the instability of the Golurkin method in that case is related to the fact that we do not have control on the pressure, right? So we don't have any stability on the pressure, and as I said yesterday, if things may go wrong, they do go wrong, so, so pressure is, uh, uh, oscillates if you don't satisfy the IMSUB compatibility condition. We will see that in more detail when dealing with the Stokes problem alone. Okay, so let's, let's consider again the second problem, the Stokes problem, the, the uh, mixed interpolation. We can write the Stokes problem in this way. So we have an operator L applied to the velocity U and the pressure P, which has two components, one corresponding to the, let's say, momentum equation, and the other corresponding to the continuity equation. This is called continuity equation because it comes from the conservation of mass. Okay? <coughs> anyway, in, in our case, we have minus viscosity Laplacian of U plus radiant of P equals to F, and divergence of u equal to zero. And that's a certain right-hand side that I denote here by uh, script uh, f. OK, so that has a problem. So now the idea that some people had was the following. We can write the first order derivatives, the gradient of the pressure and the divergence of the velocity, as a sort of convective term, as a sort of convective term. How? As follows. In the 2D case, in the 2D case those first order terms, gradient of pressure and divergence of u, can be written as a certain matrix multiplying the first derivative of the unknown plus another matrix multiplying the second derivative of the unknown. This is easily checked. If we compute that matrix multiplied by the first derivative or, or the derivative with, the first, um, uh, with, uh, with respect to the first coordinate of, uh, of the pressure uh, of the unknown, we have here uh, uh, derivative of pressure with respect to x1, and here we have derivative of pressure with respect to x2. So we have the gradient of the pressure. And in the last component, we have derivative of u1 with respect to x1 plus derivative of u2 with respect to x2. So we have the divergence of the velocity. So we can write the, the first order terms in a sort of convective uh, form. So this is a matrix that we can call A1. It's a matrix time derivative with respect to x1 of the unknown plus A2 derivative with respect to x2 of the unknown, okay? So, since we can see those terms F as convective term, what would happen if we apply a sort of SUPG strategy to the Stokes problem? Let's see what happens. What was the SUPG method? Let me recall it. Uh, we saw that uh, yesterday. The SUPG method is the following. We, we have to multiply the residual of the equation, residual meaning, from now on, the term residual will be used for the following. We have the operator LU, which in the, in the, in the convection diffusion reaction equation is LU minus K Laplacian of U plus A gradient of U plus SU. And that has to be equal to F, okay? So, of course, when we compute LUH minus F, which is minus K Laplacian of UH plus a dot gradient of uh minus s uh or excuse me plus s uh minus f this for the exact solution is zero but for the finite element solution of course is not zero in general okay so this is what we will call the residual of the finite element solution okay that's the residual of the finite element solution that is point, point wise the fi the finite element solution uh does not satisfy the differential equation it satisfies the differential equation in a certain weak sense, okay? 
that's what we call the residual. So essentially, the SUPG method consists in in uh, in what? In multiple in adding to the Golurkin terms, which are the terms in black here, <coughs> adding the residual of the differential equation multiplied by the convective operator applied to the test function. So this is the convective operator applied to the test function and multiplied by a scalar tau. Okay, that's what it, the SUPG method is. So let's see what happens if we apply the SUPG method to the Stokes problem. So that would mean that we have to add to the Golurkin terms, we have to add the residual multiplied by the convective operator that in this case are the first order terms, so gradient of Q divergence of V, multiplied by a certain matrix, because since this is a vector, now that could be a matrix, okay? So just see what happens. Now that matrix has um, two blocks, two blocks, one corresponding to the gradient of the pressure and the other corresponding to the divergence of the velocity. So this, this is, a, in, in 2D, this is a two times two block and, in, and this is one times one block. So let us take it, for simplicity, let us take it as diagonal. Um, how do we take it? So we have a scalar diagonal for corresponding to the first uh, uh, term, the gradient of the pressure, and another scalar corresponding to the divergence of this. So that's the design so far. It doesn't have any justification for the moment, but just let's take it as, as it is. Okay? And now let's try to apply the SUPG method to the Stokes problem. So it's sort of, of surprising because it's not a convection diffusion equation, it's an elliptic problem, but we consider the first order terms as, as advective terms, so to speak, and then we will apply the SUPG method. So the problem now is the following. We have to find a finite element velocity and a finite element pressure such that these equations hold. hold. And what do these equations have? We have first the Galerkin terms. Remember that I, I, I have written here the equation as a single variation equation. When we take the test function for the pressure equal to zero, we've recovered the momentum equation, so the first equation. And we, we, when we take the, the test function for the uh, pressure equal to zero and the velocity different from zero, we recover the first momentum equation, okay? The first equation, the momentum equation. So those are the Galerkin terms. The first row corresponds to the Galerkin terms. What about the second and the third row? Well, this is nothing but this operator. So we have the residual, residual, times that uh, the convective term applied to the test function multiplied, in this case, by a matrix. That's what we have. So that's what is written here. It's the part of the Stokes operator. It's just a part, which is the convective term, OK? So how do we get that? Well, uh, that matrix is diagonal, so that, ma that vector is tau 1. Remember that that, that scalar, ta tau 1 multiplied by the gradient. So this is tau 1 multiplied by the gradient of the test, of pressure test function plus, well, look at that. that, that that's what <laughs> I had. Um, plus tau 2 uh, times divergence of the uh, velocity test function. And that that is multiplying the first uh, that is going to multiply the first uh, uh, component of the residual, and that's going to multiply the second component of the residual. That's what we have here. This is, mu this is multiplying the first component of the residual, and this is multiplying the second component of the residual. Since the, the equation is divergence of u equal to zero, we don't have any right-hand side. So please take a look at that, and, and, and tell me if you understand what is written here, because it, it's important uh, uh, to see which is the uh, structure of those uh, of those terms. Okay, is it clear? So it's an SUPG strategy applied to the Stokes problem. That's the idea, and we have used um, the first order terms, the advective operator applied to the test function. Okay. Uh, another comment is that here again, as as for the convection diffusion reaction equation, the Laplacian is not well defined uh, all over the domain, but only in the interior of the elements. That's why we integrate over each element, and, and then we sum for all the elements. Okay, that's why we uh, uh, understand that residual element-wise, not globally, but just element by element. And that term is also written as the integral over the elements, but that could be written as a, as a global integral, of course, because uh, that's only the first, the first derivatives and the first derivatives are well-defined everywhere, okay? 
So that's the structure of the SUPG method applied to the Stokes problem. Okay. And now the next idea is, what, what do we see here? We see that this is just part of the Stokes, Stokes operator applied to the test function. Which part? The first order term. So now the idea is, what would happen if we apply all the Stokes operator to the test function? Okay. So that would yield the following stabilizing term. That would be even easier. Instead of uh, just using the convective operator applied to the test function, we use the whole operator. You see what is written here? The only difference is that inst instead of, of P, a script P here, which is only part of the, the convective term, uh, so to speak, applied to the test functions, we use all the operator L. And what does it mean? It means that the first component of L has also the viscous term. That's the only difference. In the case of the Stokes problem, that's the only difference. Okay. So the only difference is that term, so that we, we multiply the residual of the first equation not only by the gradient of the test function, but also by the Laplacian, by the viscous term applied to the uh, velocity test function. And that's how it looks like. Okay, that's, that's the structure. That's the structure of the method. Uh, we will see something similar in the final method, but not, not exactly the same. So we have a matrix the operator of the differential equation to be solved applied to the test function times the residual of the finite element solution. Understanding by residual what I, what, what I have uh, written here. Okay? That is that the method is called the Golurkin list squares method. Okay. Why is this called Golurkin list squares method? The reason for that is that the term that we add it's a sort of least squares term. In which sense? Imagine you want to solve the system AX equal to B, and maybe it's not even a square. So you want to, minim to solve X by minimizing this uh, least, by taking the minimum of this uh, norm. Okay, that's the least squares method applied to uh, an algebraic system. If you want to minimize that, so this is nothing but a, a, this is algebra. Okay, so those are vectors, and this is the standard uh, Euclidean norm. So this AX minus B times AX minus B, this is a scalar product. And, and, and this is minimum if the derivative with respect to X is zero. And if you take the derivative with respect to X equal to zero of that, that means that AY times scalar product AX minus B is equal to zero for all I. Okay, that's the minimization of this, uh, of this functional in finite dimensions. So this is linear algebra, okay? So that looks exactly, or that looks very similar to what we have added. What we have added is the residual. So that's what we have here, AX minus B. Here we have the residual of the differential equation, LU, LUH minus F, times uh, the operator applied to the test function, and here weighted by that matrix tau. Okay, so that's why it's called Golurkin, because we have the Golurkin terms, plus some sort of list of square step terms that are those here. But the list of square terms are weighted by tau. Okay. That's why the method is called Galerkin list squares. This is a method that was uh, designed in the mid uh, 80s and late 80s also. <coughs> and um, and that's it. So the, it is uh, as I, the, the equation written here is uh, is written as a single variational equation. It is convenient it is convenient to to split the equations into two because the Stokes problem has two equations. So how do we split the equations into two? First, we take the, the pressure test function equal to zero, and then we take the velocity test function equal to zero. So if we take the pressure test function equal to zero, we get the first equation, you see? Taking the pressure test function equal to zero, we get the Galerkin terms for the momentum equation plus this additional term. So the, remember that now Q, H is zero. So that's what do, we don't have it. And we have this, uh, this additional term. And the second equation, which is the continuity equation, is uh, Q, uh, the, the Galerkin term plus the one gradient of Q. Now V is equal to VH is equal to zero, and then the residual of the first equation. And that has to hold for all test functions VH and QH. Okay? Is it clear? That's the GLS method, Galerkin is the squares method. And now, that method works, but before doing anything, so what does it mean that it works? It means that uh, the instability of the Golurkin method is, uh, let's say, um, uh, avoided or, or is healed, is, uh, is uh, cured. Okay. Can anybody tell me why that method works? So why that method has control on the pressure? 
Can you see from the expressions, those two expressions, why do we have control on the pressure? Which is the term that is crucial in these expressions? There is only one crucial term. The, re the rest of terms are necessary for consistency and, uh, and, and, and an optimal order, but for stability, there is only one crucial term, only one. Which one would you think is the crucial one? Remember, the problem of the Golurkin method is the lack of stability on the pressure. So that problem, uh, if you trust me, is not here. So why we don't have now a lack of stability on the pressure? Why do we have control on the pressure without using any M subcondition as for the Golurkin method? What do you see there that may give you control on the pressure? Only one term. So maybe Laplacian of B, Laplacian of U. Do you think that term gives you control on the pressure? Is, is there a pressure here? No. So that term will not give you control on the pressure. This is a, the square of the viscous term. So that gives you some additional control on the second derivatives element wise. But then Laplacian of B gradient of Q, I mean, we don't even know whether this is positive or negative. And by the way, um, well, so that's a term that is going to be, let's say, an annoyment that is going to be difficult to control because when we take V equal to U, that will be a cross term that will, in the analysis, is difficult to control. So that's definitely not the source of stability. This goes to the right hand side, so nothing. That gives, gives us some more stability. We have control on the divergence of the velocity, but the velocity was already under control. Mm. So that is the divergence of that. That may be helpful for Navier-Stokes equations. That, that sometimes is helpful, but that gives us additional control on the pressure. Let's look at the second equation. We have gradient of Q Laplacian of U. When we take Q equal to P, again, we will have this term, which is not very nice. So it's a little bit awkward. We will have to, uh, uh, I mean, in the analysis, that term has to be treated carefully. But now we have an additional term, which is gradient of Q, gradient of P. When we take Q equal to P, we have gradient of P squared. That's nice. <laughs> That's a beautiful term. We have control on the pressure. We have tau 1, which is going to be positive. I haven't said which, uh, how to take tau yet. But we have the gradient of P squared. So we have control on the norm of the gradient of P squared. Okay, That's nice. That's the nice term, this one. And can you please tell me uh, what that, that resembles the weak form of what? Gradient of Q, gradient of P is the weak form of which operator? Which one? The Laplace operator. It's the weak form of the Laplace operator, exactly. So we are adding a sort of Laplacian of pressure. That's what we are doing. We are adding a sort of Laplacian of pressure to the method. That gives us control on the pressure. That's the reason for the success of the GLS method okay, and other methods that we will see. Okay, which is the matrix structure of the problem? The matrix structure is the following. We have the Golurkin terms, which are written without bar. So, K minus divergence transpose, which is the gradient. D, D. And now, we have the terms with a bar. For example, K bar. Where does K bar come from? K bar comes from the velocity-velocity term. So, velocity test function. So, the first equation corresponds to the velocity test function. The second to the pressure test function the first row to the velocity unknown and the second row, uh, excuse me, the, the first column to the uh, velocity unknown and the second column to the uh, pressure unknown. So that, that, that K bar comes from this term Laplacian and Laplacian plus divergence, divergence. Okay? For example, that term comes from, um, that term comes from, uh, where does it come from? Well, it's a transpose of this one. So this one comes from gradient of Q, Laplacian of U, that one. And the beautiful one, the only beautiful term that I have called L here because it, it resembles a Laplacian, 
is uh, affecting the two, two terms, so the term that was originally zero. Remember that what, that was zero for the Golurkin method, okay? So that's where it comes from, gradient, gradient. That's a beautiful term. And then we have a modification of the right-hand side, uh, both in the first equation and in the second equation. So that's the algebraic structure of the final system. And the important thing is that this uh, zero block is filled now, okay? With that Laplacian matrix, sort of Laplacian matrix, okay? The system is not symmetric. Uh, by the way, the Stokes system, if you take the bar matrices equal to 0 and L equals to 0, the Stokes, matrix, the Stokes system is not symmetric, but can be easily symmetrized just by, by putting a minus sign in the continuity equation, because we have here minus D transpose and D, so we just put a minus here, and that is equal to 0, okay? Because we have a 0 originally. Originally, we have a 0 for the, for the um, Galerkin method, okay? So the system now, when, when we introduce these matrices, the system is uh, non-symmetric. You cannot do anything else. So it's a non-symmetric system, which already gives you a clue that maybe it's not the best method. Because if you start uh, from a symmetric problem, you get a non-symmetric method. Maybe it's not that nice. No? Okay. Good. So how do we have to take the coefficients? Uh, that's not that easy. You know, how do we have to take tau one and tau two? Th those. Uh, I haven't said anything about that, you know. I haven't, any, I haven't said anything about tau one and tau two. What did we do for the uh, SU, uh, convection, diff convection diffusion reaction equation and the SUPG method? We analyzed very simple problems. We knew which was the sort of diffusion that we had to introduce. We uh, saw that that diffusion could be introduced by perturbing the test function, and that led us naturally to the expression of the stabilization parameter, what I called in the, in the case of the convection diffusion reaction, intrinsic time. Okay? What happens for this Stokes problem? It's not that easy. You have to use scaling arguments. What does it mean, scaling arguments? Scaling arguments means that you have to, uh, essentially, that you have to check which are the units of tau 1 and tau 2. Okay? Uh, in fact, you can, you can dress it a little bit. <laughs> By, by, by changing coordinates to the reference system, so, you know, the, the, the so-called natural coordinates, and then going back to the Cartesian coordinates and seeing how things have to behave. But essentially, it's just a, a, a matter of units, okay? It's just a matter of units. So which are the units that, um, that those coefficients have to have? Uh, the units are the following. Let's see. Let's see if we check that. For example, uh, where can we check that? Um, in the original equation here. We can check the units here. Units, as I said before, are very important. So look, let's compare this term, for example, this term, nu, gradient of velocity, gradient of velocity test function, against this one, okay? Against this one. So we have second derivatives, well, well let's say one derivative and another derivative. So the derivatives will introduce a unit of one over length, one over length, one over length squared. And here we have a viscosity. What happens with this term? First of all, we have viscosity and viscosity, so that means viscosity is square. So necessarily, tau 1 will have to scale as 1 over viscosity, because here, here we have just one viscosity, and here we have viscosity square. So tau 1 will have to scale as 1 over viscosity. That's clear. On the other hand, we have here a Laplacian times a Laplacian. So this introduces 1 over length square, and that introduces 1 over length square. And here we only have 1 over length square. Therefore, tau has to scale as a length square. You see? So tau must behave as a length square over viscosity. End of the story. No, no, uh, I mean, there is no other option. Length square over viscosity. And then everything matches. You know, all the units match if, uh, by, take, by taking tau, tau length square over viscosity. So which is the scaling of tau 2? Well, that's even easier because that's gradient of... It's viscosity, exactly. So we have here derivative of u, derivative of v, derivative of u, of u derivative of v. So the units of, of uh, tau 2 have to be the units of viscosity. Okay. So at the end, it turns out that, it's, uh, uh, well, that's a viscosity. Essentially, tau 1 has to be exactly units of length. The only unit of length that we have at the element level is the element size. So it has to scale as h squared over viscosity. And then multiplied by a coefficient, which will be an algorithmic coefficient. So it's going to be dimensionless, okay? It's going to be dimensionless. 
And tau 2 can be taken equal to 0 because, as I said, in the case of the geolast method, as I said before, th that gives us control, but we already have that control there. So tau 2, in, in, tau two in, in fact, for the Stokes problem is not necessary at all for the Stokes problem, okay? So because we already have the, all the gradient control here, so that's just adding the control and the divergence, which is nothing. For the Stokes problem, it is uh, absolutely uh, not essential. Okay, so it, it turns out that if we check, if we take tau 1 in this way uh, and tau 2 in this way, the method works. What does it mean that it works? It, we have the following result. We have that the, the bilinear form of the, of the GLS method, of the Galerkin list of squares method, happens to be coercive, happens to be coercive, and we have this optimal est uh, convert, um, error estimate. It means that the solution u minus the finite element solution is bounded by the interpolation error. Again, that's the best we can hope for. Okay, so that should be the finite element space. Sorry about that. There should be an H here. Okay, so that's the interpolation error. So this is perfect. That's not, uh, the best we can hope for. And again, like in the SUPG method, that happens in which norm? In this norm. That the norm in which this happens is this triple bar norm that contains, sorry again, there is an error here, this is the gradient of the velocity. It's full of typos. So this is uh, viscosity times the gradient of the viscosity squared, so essentially the H1 norm, recall that this is the H1 norm, plus this term, and this term gives us control on the gradient of the pressure. Okay, so we are done. We have stability and we have convergence in a norm that provides, uh, provides us information both on the velocity and on the pressure. In fact, it's even more than that. Uh, in fact, uh, we can move from that norm to the L2 norm of the pressure. Okay, but, uh, I'll mention that uh, later. Okay, uh, any question? No questions? Is, is everything clear? Good. Um, well, there is a remark, a historical remark in the case uh, of the Stokes problem that was not what was originally called colloquially the square. Um, uh, it was given to a, a different method, but, but we will, because there was a change in sign unjustified. It is also possible to obtain uh, the same result, but instead of working only with the gradient of the pressure, working with the whole residual. In fact, this one is better because you have uh, a separate control on the velocity and the pressure. Okay. So that's another remark. Again, the gradient of the velocity is missing here. Okay, uh, that works in the case of continuous of continuous uh, elements. Maybe 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 I will skip that and I will explain that section when talking about the Stokes problem later. Yes, I will skip that and talking about the Stokes problem. Okay. So now we have done something uh, sort of a strange because we have identified two, pro two problems, two stability problems of the Golurkin method. So uh, the convection diffusion equation and the Stokes problem. One fails because of uh, lack of, con uh, of control on the derivatives. The other because of lack of control on the pressure. They are different. One is a singularly perturbed problem. The other is a mixed problem. So they are different. In one case, we have designed the the SUPG method. In the other case, we have designed the Golurkin list of squares method. And now let's see if we can apply the, the technique that we just have designed, the Golurkin list of squares method, back to the convection diffusion reaction equation. Okay? And that can be very easily done. That's very simple. So let's apply the Golurkin list of squares method, but to the convection diffusion reaction equation. The, what, what, is the, what is the idea? It's very simple. In fact, it doesn't depend on the equation. So we have the, Gol the Golurkin terms, the bilinear form of the problem minus the right-hand side equal to zero. And to the Golurkin terms, we add the sum for all the elements of the integral within each element of the Golurkin list of squares operator. So, uh, so it's the residual of the differential equation applied to the finite element solution. And the operator L, the, the, the differential operator we are dealing with, applied to the test function in abstract. So that's as simple as that. Okay. So now, now that we have the idea, you see, it? I mean, that, that does not depend on the problem. That's the definition of the method, if you wish. Okay? So this is the definition of the Golurkin list of squares method. 
And now we can apply it to the case in which the, the operator L is the diffusion convection reaction operator. Okay? In that case, what do we get? We get what is written here. We get uh, in the, um, a modification of the bilinear form of the problem, which is the original Galerkin form, plus the sum for all the elements of the integral within each element of the operator L applied to the test function times L of u, because, of course, that term L of v multiplied by f goes to the right-hand side. It's, it's given, of course, f is given. So that's the uh, modification. In the case of the uh, convection diffusion reaction equation, L of applied to V is expressed here, and L applied to U is given there. So that's what we have to add. And in the case of the GLS, uh, the right-hand side, we have uh, tau L of V applied uh, multiplied by F, which is expressed here. Okay. So in the case of the Stokes problem, I mentioned that the crucial term, the term that makes the method work, is this one, gradient of Q, gradient of P. That's the, the term that makes the method work. The other terms are introduced for consistency because we want, uh, what is consistency in the finite element case? Consistency means that the exact solution satisfies the variational equations, the discrete variational equations. And in that case, of course, if we plug here, we replace UH by U and PH by P, the equations are exactly satisfied. Why? Because, of course, the Galerkin terms are satisfied by the exact solution, and the exact solution makes it equal to zero. Okay? And likewise for this term and for this one. So the consistency is ensured. Of course, we could take the perturbation of the, of the, uh, of the test function uh, in different ways, and that's what we are doing, in fact. We are taking different forms of the perturbation of the test function. But the important thing is to keep the residual um, in the equations so as to keep uh, consistency. So, um, as I said, the crucial term for stability in the Stokes problem was gradient of Q, gradient of P. Which one, which is the crucial term for stability in the case of the convection diffusion reaction equation, which is the crucial one. What do you think is uh, essential? Look at all those terms. So here we have three terms multiplied by three. We have nine terms here. Which of these nine terms is the only one that cannot be deleted? I mean, for consistency, all those cannot be deleted for consistency. And for consistency, you could delete any of those for consistency. Okay, you could delete any of those. But for stability, which one is the one that you cannot delete of the nine terms that you have? You have nine, right? Three times three is nine. So which one? There is only one of these nine terms that you cannot skip. That gives you stability. Which one? Which one do you think? What? Which one? A dot del what? A dot del V H. So we keep this one. Oh, sorry. We keep this one and exactly A dot gradient of V, A dot gradient of U. Why? What does this term do from the physical point of view? No, it's not a Laplacian. It's less than a Laplacian. What? What does that method do? Remember the original design, A gradient of V, A gradient of U, does what? What sort of mechanism does it introduce? That was the very first term we introduced when we dealing with the convection diffusion equation. Why? Why? What is the physical uh, mechanism uh, through which that introduces stability? It's very important to keep that in mind. Well, well conve yeah, convection is the is the problem that we have. Convection dominated flows, and the way to the way to uh, uh, let's say uh, heal that problem 
of convection domination was what? What was the way that we devised uh, to uh, solve the problem of convection domination, uh, of the instability of convective dominated flows? Yes, here that gives us control on the derivative along where? Everywhere. What? Yes, in the elements, but that is, is that is that does that does this gives us con control? Uh, does that give us control over the whole derivative of the whole gradient? No. Over which derivatives does that give us control? Somebody said that along the streamlines. That only gives us control on the derivatives along the streamlines. And why? Through which mechanism? Which is the mechanism that through which that gives us control along the streamlines? Of course, we control a gradient of u, but physically, what have we done when we introduced this term? We have introduced what? No, the, the, the physical meaning of tau times a gradient of v, a gradient of u, is what? What is the physical meaning? And now the question is very simple. What is the physical meaning of tau a gradient of v a gradient of u? Remember the origin. The, the, let's say, let's go back. Let's uh, 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 pull the thread to the beginning of the argumentation that we had yesterday. What is tau a gradient of v a gradient of u? What was what was the first method, the very first method, due to von Neumann? designed to avoid instabilities of the, of the fin uh, centered finite differences or, or, uh, or Galerkin method. What was the first method designed by von Neumann, 50s? No, no. It was, the mechanism was very simple. Why does the, in other words, why does the Galerkin method fail? It, it is, uh, uh, which was one of the interpretations why the Galerkin method failed? It's under diffusive. What was the solution that we proposed? I mean, that von Neumann proposed. Adding artificial diffusion. What does that term introduce? Tau a gradient of v a gradient of u. What does it does uh, it do? What? A and that is what. That is what. If the uh, if the idea was to add diffusion, this is diffusion. But what type of diffusion? This diffusion where? Is it everywhere? Diffusion everywhere? It's not diffusion everywhere. It's diffusion where? In which direction? This, is this an isotropic diffusion? Tau a gradient of v a gradient of u? Is that diffusion introduced isotropically everywhere? No, it's not. It's diffusion in which direction? Oh, you already said that. What? In the streamlines. In the streamlines. So the only term of the nine terms that we have here that you cannot delete for stability is tau a gradient of v and a gradient of u. And that is streamline diffusion. That is streamline diffusion. That, remember, if I go back. That was the origin to introduce streamline diffusion. That was the origin. The introduction of a streamline C is equal to A, I said. The introduction of a streamline diffusion leads to this term. Nothing else, okay? Nothing else. So that's the introduction of a streamline diffusion. Okay. So now we have a result that is exactly the same. Uh, uh, exactly the same as for the SUPG method. It turns out that if you design tau exactly as for the SUPG method, exactly as for the SUPG method, you get exactly the same result as for the SUPG method. So that means that we have the bilinear form of the method is coercive, it is continuous, and you have optimal stability in a norm that again is the same as for the SUPG method. Okay, it, we have the, the, the norm that would come from the Galerkin method plus control on the streamline derivative. Okay, 
that is the idea. So, that is very easy to explain. We have exactly the same uh, theoretical result as for the SUPG method, no difference. Okay? We have control uh, that means stability and convergence in the same norm. So, the gain is 0 concerning stability and convergence. Okay? But it is a more, let us say, conceptually, maybe it is uh, easier to understand. It is conceptually is a, is a method that may be uh, uh, easier to understand. So, it is just you have the residual of the operator and you apply the test function, uh, you apply the operator to the test function and you scale it by tau. Okay? And you add that term to the Golurkin terms. Okay, so, that was one method. One method. Let us go to a, com a different method. But at the end, they are all related. That's why I explained it. A different method that was designed from a different concept, which is the destabilization through bubble functions. Okay? Yes. Yes. So you will see why. When 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 introducing the final method, you you will see why. Uh, in fact, even for the convection diffusion equation, the GLS and the SUPG method work similarly, but. Uh, the SUPG method is better for higher order elements, uh, happens to be better. This term, the, the cross term, this, uh, that, that just, uh, this uh, cross term Laplacian of B, A gradient of U, which of course does not appear with the SUPG method, in fact is disturbing. So it introduces, it subtracts a little bit of stability. I mean, asymptotically, the uh, behavior is the same. Asymptotically in H, when H goes to zero, the behavior of the SUPG method and the GLS method is the same, but um, but um, I mean for a fixed stage H usually it's uh, preferable to use SUPG than uh, GLS. But that's just a, a, a personal comment. That's uh, we will see later why it, um, the GLS method uh, has been superseded by another method. Okay, let, let's go rapidly because this is not that important. Uh, to another uh, stabilization method that was designed for the Stokes problem originally, uh, and then th that the panel is different. That panel is very different. Okay. Um, the idea is to consider the Stokes problem and consider the Golurkin list me method, the Golurkin list squares method, using linear elements for both the velocity and the pressure, taking tau two equal to zero, and since we are using linear elements. Within each element, the Laplacian of the velocity and Laplacian of the test function is going to be zero. Okay, so the Laplacian of is going to be zero. So the Golurkin least squares method, in the case of linear elements, boils down to this expression. So we don't have many terms. So if you look here, if we look here, we don't have the Lap this term is zero because the Laplacian of B is zero, so that term is zero. Tau 2 can be taken in 0, so this term is 0. So the first equation is unaltered, no difference in the first equation with respect to the Golurkin method. And then we have that term equal to 0. So we only have the crucial term, gradient of Q, gradient of P, and then the right hand side for consistency. Okay? So we, that's the method. In the case of linear elements, linear elements using P1 elements um, and tau 2 equal to 0. Okay. Alternatively, it was known it was known that there is a method that works for the Stokes problem without stabilization. Remember that we said yesterday that uh, in order to have a method that works for the Stokes problem, we have to satisfy a certain if subcondition. You remember that, okay? We haven't insisted on that because we will see that in more detail when talking about the Stokes problem. However, I, I anticipate that there is an interpolation that satisfies that in subcondition, which is the following. It, you take the classical P1 interpolation for the pressure, the classical P1 interpolation for the velocity. So let's assume this is the velocity and triangles are pressures, for example. So you use uh, the corners of the element to interpolate velocity and pressure. But for the velocity, you add an additional function that is called a bubble function, which has the degree of freedom right in the middle of the element. Why is it called a bubble function? Remember, we said, so in that case, we will interpolate the velocity as the sum of the shape functions times the nodal values, the shape functions that depend on x times the nodal values. 
And those shape functions, remember, take the value 1 at one node and 0 at the other nodes. Okay? That's the, the way we construct the shape functions in the case of the simple Lagrangian interpolation. Remember, 1 at one node and 0 at the other node. So how will that shape function look like? If, we, if I try to draw it in perspective, so it will be the shape function associated to that node will be 1 at the center and will be 0 at the, at the uh, corners and also 0 on the edges. Okay? So that will be the shape of that shape function. So, okay? That will be the shape of that shape function. It will be the value 1 and value 0. So that, since it has this uh, shape, it is called bubble function. Okay? This is called a bubble function. It's a function that vanishes on the boundary of the element. That's why it is called a bubble function. Okay? In the, it's very easy to construct. In, in, in 1D, in 1D, the bubble function is just that quadratic polynomial. Okay? It's just a parabola, a quadratic polynomial. In, in 2D, the bubble function is cubic, can be shown to be cubic. Okay? So this is... Uh, basic interpolation theory of finite elements. Okay? It's a function that uh, is a cubic polynomial in terms of the uh, coordinates x and y and takes the value 1 here and 0 on the, on the edges. There are also other types of bubbles. So bubble in general is a function that vanishes on the boundary of the element. Okay? Okay. So it turns out that um, uh, if you use a linear interpolation for the pressure, and linear interpolation for the velocity plus a bubble function, enriched with a bubble function, that method works. This is what it said. This element satisfies the aim condition. We will go back to this uh, later when talking about the Stokes problem. Just give it for granted for the moment. Okay. Okay. So let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. Within each element, the velocity can be expanded enriched with the bubble function, the velocity enriched with the bubble function can be expanded in this way, can be expanded as the linear velocity, that's the linear part of the velocity, plus the bubble function multiplied by the degree of freedom associated to the bubble function. You see, it is just the expansion of the velocity in terms of the linear part plus the bubble part, which is a sort that that degree of freedom in that case, may not be the velocity, but the increment of velocity with respect to the linear interpolation. Okay, so that, that's just a degree of freedom. Linear part plus the bubble part. Okay, good. So now, um, what, what happens if we take the test function equal to the bubble part, to the bubble function? What happens if we take the test function equal to the bubble in the Galerkin equations? Uh, and that we do it for element for a certain given uh, for a given element uh, k. So it happens the following: I take I, I just consider the Galerkin terms. So these are the Galerkin terms. These are the Galerkin terms, and I take the test function v equal to the to that bubble function. Okay, I take the test function equal to the bubble of a certain element of a given element e. Okay, I take the bubble of a given element e. Okay, so what do we have? We have the Galerkin term, the Galerkin term, because we are using the Galerkin method now. And now we can write this term as follows: We have, remember that the velocity has the bubble part and the linear part. Okay, so we move the linear part to the right-hand side. You see, so the linear part of U B is moved to the right-hand side here. You see, that linear part multiplied by V is moved to the right-hand side. And we keep in the left-hand side just the bubble part, which is the bubble function multiplied by the degree of freedom. Okay? We keep in the left-hand side only this term. Good. And we have he that term here. This term is also moved to the right-hand side. And that is, as I said, the linear part. Okay, and let's see, what is that? What is that? This, is, this term is the integral of the test function multiplied by the bubble First remark, the bubble happens to be different from zero only on that element. Okay? So the integral over the computational domain can be restricted to the integral over each element we are considering. Why? 
because the bubble function is 0 outside the element. Okay, so, we can take the integral only over element e. For another function, that does not happen. Imagine, if I have a mesh, if I have a mesh, standard finite element mesh, for example, if I take the uh, test function associated to this node, of course, if, even if I am considering this element, even if I am considering this element, the test function associated to this node is 0, is 0 in this element, 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 everywhere, okay? So, it's not defined only on an element, okay? It is uh, it's defined um, o over all the elements that share a certain node. However, in the case of bubbles, there is only one element that has this bubble. So, we can restrict the integral to that element. And then, therefore, we have b multiplied by f. That's what this uh, uh, bracket means. Well, that could be the standard bracket. Then, if we integrate that term by parts, we have gradient. So, we undo the integration by parts that is done to obtain the Stokes problem. So, we get gradient of p and then we the boundary term b times p dot normal. That's the normal to the element. And then, undoing the integration by parts, again, we have the Laplacian of u uh, here, moving that derivative here. And here, we have the boundary term. And what happens with this element? It happens that on the boundary of the element, the bubble is 0. So, this term is 0. On the bubble of the element, this term is 0. And that term is 0 because the linear part, remember that uh is the linear part of the solution. And the Laplacian of the linear part is 0. So, this is 0 and this is 0. And we are left with this term. Okay? So, that's what the only thing we have. Great. And remember that on the left-hand side, we have the degree of freedom associated to the bubble times this term. That's great because we can isolate we can isolate that degree of freedom and get this expression and get this expression. So, what have we done? What we have done is in the case of bubble, since the bubble is defined only on an element, we have been able to obtain the expression of the degree of freedom associated to the bubble in terms of, in that case, the pressure in the element. Okay? That process in the finite element context is called condensation. When you are able to uh, eliminate or express internal degrees of freedom in terms of the boundary degrees of freedom, that term is called condensation. And, and it, it, it appears in, in other uh, situations as well. Okay? So, we have been able to condense the degree of freedom of the interior bubble in terms of the boundary values, in, or, or excuse me, the, the, the values over the element, in that case, of the pressure. Okay? And since we have been able to obtain that degree of freedom, now we can go back to the original equation and insert that expression in the, in the Golurkin method. So, what do we have? What is the continuity equation? What do we have in the continuity equation? In the continuity equation, we have Q, divergent of U, which has the bubble part and the linear part. So, this is the linear part, UH, plus the bubble part. So, we are summing for all the components because these are vectors, so j's are the uh, components in a certain element, and those are the bubble degrees of freedom. But we have just got the bubble degrees of freedom. We have just got them. That's the k component of the bubble degree of freedom. We have just obtained the bubble degree of freedom. Therefore, we can replace what we have obtained previously in this expression. If we do it, we get this. It looks, uh, uh, let's say, nasty, but it's very simple. It's just... Uh, the, uh, this expression inserted into uh, this term. So, we have in the continuity equation, we have Q divergent of the linear part plus the bubble part, but it happens that the bubble part can be expressed in terms of the pressure as we have seen before. Okay, and now what do we have if we look at this expression? In this case, in this case, Q is constant. Uh, excuse me, Q is linear, and therefore, the gradient of Q is a constant within each element. The gradient of the pressure test function is a constant within each element. So, we can rearrange this uh, term. We can rearrange this. I haven't written that. Yeah, I haven't written that later. We can rearrange this term. Let me do it um, here. We can play a little bit with this term. So, 
Here we have a coefficient. This is just a coefficient. This is a scalar number. Don't worry about that. But then we have the integral over the element, we call it omega e, of b of the test of element e component j times f minus gradient of q, or excuse me, gradient of p. And then we have the integral, the integral of b j e dot gradient of q h. But gradient of q h, gradient of q h is constant. So I can take it out of this integral, but I can also put it inside this integral. Okay? I can take it out of this integral and put it inside this integral. And now you see what, it, what will happen. I will have, if I do that, I will have already gradient of q multiplied by f minus gradient of p. That's what I will have. You see, I move it here outside the integral because it's constant inside this one. And that will be multiplied by a matrix which is precisely b tensor product b. So that is what is written. When I do that, when I do that, I'll get this expression for a certain matrix that is defined here. That matrix is defined here. That, that is the coefficient, 1 over uh, viscosity times the gradient of b gradient of b integrated. And then we have that coefficient again. Okay? That's what we have. That I, I will have the gradient, the integral of the, of the bubble, the, the integral of the bubble that comes from this term, and then all these tensor products with the remaining part, okay, with remaining b. Okay, so let's look at this expression. Let's look at this expression. What do we have here? We have a minus sign, so we have a plus and a minus here. What have we got? We have got exactly the same, exactly the same, except for the definition of tau, except for the definition of tau, which is here is given here. We have got exactly the same as for the GLS method. Exactly the same. Remember, it's, it's written here, the GLS method. We have got that here. Gradient of P minus F, tau gradient of Q. Q. Here tau was a scalar. Here tau is given by the, components of, by the components of the bubble functions, of the bubble vector function. Okay? So we conclude that the use of the P2 plus bubble element, that element, by the way, is called P2 plus bubble. It's also called the mini element. We will see that later, or uh, Arnold, Bredzi, Douglas uh, element. Uh, we will see that later. So the use of the that insuperstable element is similar or, or, or almost identical to the use of the linear linear uh, element that means velocity interpolation, pressure interpolation, and the Galerkin list squares method. Okay, uh, uh, just with a different definition of tau. That's what we have got. Okay, and that's the same remark as before. So that's the conclusion. The GLS method, Galerkin list squares method, the Galerkin method, excuse me, the Galerkin method with that element that is insuperstable is very similar to the SUPG method, excuse me, a GLS method with linear elements. So now the idea is, okay, so what, what, what is the conclusion? The only thing that you have to keep in mind, the only thing after all this discussion, the only thing that you have, that you have to keep in mind is that adding a bubble, adding a bubble, has solved the, st the stability problem of the Golurkin method. So now let's go to the back to the convection diffusion equation. So you see, we are playing with both problems uh, in this chapter. So let's see what happens if we apply this idea to the convection diffusion reaction equation. Let's add bubbles to the interior of the element. So we have, in that case, only the convection diffusion equation. And we do the same. We do the same, which means that we interpolate the unknown, in that case is a scalar, u, temperature, whatever, concentration. Okay, so the idea now is to use the same strategy applied to the convection diffusion equation. So we split the unknown u into a linear part and a bubble part, and we play the same game. We play the same game. So we have, we add uh, to the, um, I mean, we can take in the variational form of the problem, the test function equal to the bubble. Now it is, is, is a scalar bubble. It is a scalar bubble, and we will have that. When v is equal to the bubble, we will have, when the test function is equal to the bubble, we will have this expression. This is the convective, uh, um, the, conv the diffusion convection uh, by linear form, and this is equal, there is an equal here missing, to what? We split u into the linear part, so we have 
gradient of B, gradient of U, linear part plus gradient of B, gradient of U, bubble part. And the same for the convective term, the linear part and the convective part. Okay. And now, uh, as for the Stokes problem, that term can be shown to be zero. Why? Because we integrate by parts. We will get the Laplacian of U, the linear part, the Laplacian of the linear part is zero. And the boundary term is zero because the bubble vanishes on the boundary. Okay? So that term is zero. It cancels. Okay? And that term, uh, what happens with this? So we can express this as the bubble function times the bubble degree of freedom, which is this one. Okay? This term, this term is exactly this one. Gradient of B, and then U B uh, H is the bubble function times the bubble degree of freedom. And then for the convective term, we have the same. We have the, uh, the bubble function times the bubble degree of freedom. Okay? This term is this one here. Then we have the linear part, the linear part, and the right hand side. That's what we have. That's what we, uh, we have. And now again, we can eliminate, we can condense, that's the technical word. The degree of freedom for the bubble, the degree of freedom for the bubble can be condensed, can be obtained in terms of the linear part from this expression. That's what we get here. Okay, we call a that coefficient, which is uh, you see the, the coef this one, this coefficient plus this one is multiplying the degree of freedom of the bubble. Is multiplying u b e, multiplying u b e, and we can. Uh, from this expression, obtain U B E in terms of this, uh, as it is explained here. Okay, and what can we do? Now we can take the test function equal to the linear part, which is piecewise linear. So again, if we take the test function equal to the linear part, this expression is very important. Look, we have we take the test function equal to the linear part, and we have a split the unknown the unknown into the linear part plus the bubble part. Okay, we will see this expression later. So that's uh, very typical, very simple, but uh, useful. And now, what is the point? The point is that for the bubble part, this that we have added, which is given here, so is k gradient of b gradient of u bubble plus uh, the bubble part plus the convective term applied to the bubble part. Where is the? What is the point? The point is that we already know which is the bubble degree of freedom in terms of the linear part. So we just have to insert it. We just have to insert it. We do all the calculations, and Remember, the concept is we have obtained the bubble part, the bubble degree of freedom in terms of the linear part, and we just have to insert it here, which means here. We just have to insert it here. And at the end, what do we get? We get this expression. That's the contribution that we have to add to the Golurkin term. And what does it look like? Look, we have a scalar times the velocity times the gradient of the test function, the linear part, multiplied by the residual of the finite element solution. You see? Again, we have the same expression as for the SU, uh, very similar to the SUPG method, or in the case of linear elements, in the case of linear elements, the SUPG method and the GLS method are identical because uh, the derivative, second derivatives within the element are zero. Okay, for linear elements. So we have got exactly the same as for the GLS method. So conclusion, it seems that adding bubbles, adding bubbles helps both for the Stokes problem and for the convection diffusion reaction equation. Okay. Uh, if there is a zero order term, that analogy is not valid anymore. But in general, adding bubbles leads to the same as as for the as as, as to as the L, G, SUPG method. Okay, so that's it. Let's go abstract. Let's go general. So we have been what have been doing? We have been playing with the convection diffusion reaction equation and the Stokes problem all the time. Okay, we have been playing. Now let's see. Let's try to design a general method. Let's try to design a general method from what we have learned. Somehow, I have tried to um, uh, explain things as they have been developed. You know, somehow. Uh, historically, so to speak. So let, let's do now, uh, let's design now a general method. And for that, we will not restrict ourselves to linear, to scalar problems, but to vector problems, to uh, problems in which the unknown is a vector. Okay? That will encompass both the convection diffusion equation, which is a scalar, and the Stokes system. 
we will call that a system of convection diffusion reaction equations. Okay? And how we will write that system? That will be a partial differential equation of second order in general, LU equals to F, where that L will be a differential operator of second order. So it will have a term of order zero, so a matrix S multiplied by the unknowns U. So now this is a, a vector unknown. Vector not in the geometrical sense, but in the sense of an array, okay? So it has different components. I mean, it does, it, it, it does not uh, change bases uh, properly, okay? So it's, uh, for example, in the Stokes problem, it has velocity and pressure. So it's not a vector, geometrically speaking, it's just an array. Okay, so in the case of the Stokes problem, that would be velocity and pressure. So a zero order term, a first order term, which is matrices AI multiplied by the derivative with respect to XI of U. Those matrices can be constant. I've written that this way because uh, for compressible flows, it's useful to write it this way. But you can consider, for the moment, consider matrices A. Barber? Pardon me? I just want you to comment on uh, the concept of problems for other elements. For, for other elements, elements, yes. Well, yes, the, the analogy goes not uh, uh, beyond that, you know. There is a method that, uh, that tries to compute optimal bubbles. So the analogy between stabilization and, and, and bubbles goes not beyond linear elements. So it's just linear elements plus bubbles. If you have elements for higher than one, then adding bubbles is not equivalent to, uh, to those destabilization methods that we have seen. However, uh, let's say you, you can pull from the idea of uh, using bubbles to stabilize and design methods, this is a, another line, that try to obtain optimal stabilization from certain bubbles, okay, but not necessarily cubic bubbles. So th that leads to the so-called residual free bubbles and pseudo-residual free bubbles, and there is a, a whole world about that. Of course, I just want to uh, uh, highlight the main, the main ideas, but uh, I haven't... I haven't, I haven't I, I am not going to explain that in detail. It's just the, the idea of adding to the linear to the linear function, adding a bubble is important for what we will see now. Okay, that idea, that general idea. In fact, yes, the, the point is that the idea of using bubbles as a stabilization method has gone much farther. Okay, although I would say my impression is that uh, it has stopped in the last uh, ten years. Uh, you don't see many papers about that. So let's consider that general problem I was saying. Suppose that matrices A are constant. If not, uh, that would modify the reactive term. So I will write the convective term in this form. And the diffusive term, the second order term, can be written in general in this way. Derivative with respect to Xi of a matrix Kij, derivative of the unknown with respect to Xj. Is everybody familiar with this notation? Yes? Somebody is not familiar with it? I mean, is not comfortable with it? So that a general system of convection diffusion reaction equations. I have taken the simplest boundary condition u equal to zero on the boundary, which is not always possible. Who can tell me under which condition I can prescribe all the components of u equal to zero on the boundary? Who tells me under which condition of the differential operator is it possible to prescribe all the components of u? Under which condition of the coefficients that you see in this expression? can tell me that. Well, it's not an easy question. That can be done as soon as the uh, quadratic form Kij is non-degenerate. So that means that uh, it's, um, let's say, the hypermatrix associated to K is non-singular. In other words, it means that we have control on the second derivatives of all the unknowns. For example, for the Stokes problem, we have the Laplacian of the velocity, but we don't have the Laplacian of the pressure. Okay, so for the Stokes problem, we cannot prescribe the pressure and the velocity on the boundary. Okay, so that's that, that boundary condition is just for the simplicity. Uh, so this is the differential operator, and for simplicity, I take that boundary condition. But in in the applications, it's not always possible because of the expression of the diffusive part. It's not always possible to prescribe all the components of U. Okay. And the example you have, you may think about, is the uh, Stokes problem. In the Stokes problem, you can prescribe the velocity, but you cannot prescribe the pressure. And why is it? Because the the quadratic form Kij, 
think of this as a quadratic form, is non is degenerate in the pressure part. So, in other words, we don't have second derivatives of pressure. Okay. Anyway, so that's that. This is just for simplicity. Okay. <coughs> so we have uh, the vectors are have d capital D unknowns. Those are uh, a i k i g and s are d times d matrices that a j goes from one to the number of space dimensions two or three. And um, the functional setting, if this is non-degenerate, if that matrix is non-degenerate, the functional setting is H1. Okay? So all the components U have to be in L1. Again, for the Stokes problem, this is not the case. This is just to simplify. For the Stokes problem, since matrix K is degenerate, um, uh, so the quadratic form associated to K is degenerate, um, the velocity components have to belong to H1. But pressures have to belong only to, to L2. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, once we have this general convection diffusion reaction equation, it is easy to obtain the weak form of the problem. How do we get the weak form of the problem? We multiply uh, that equation by a test function that will be a vector test function, and we integrate over the domain, and we integrate the second order terms by parts. So what we get is this expression b of u v equal to l of v for all test functions v, and the expression of v is given here. So you see we have the convective term multiplied by the test function, the reactive term multiplied by the test function, and the second order term integrated by parts. Okay, integrated by parts, and the boundary term does not appear because we have assumed that u is equal to zero on the boundary. And also, we take the test function v to be 0 on the boundary. So this is the bilinear form associated to the problem. And that is true for any second order um, differential equation of vector type. In some cases, it would be possible to integrate by parts also the, the first order term, that the, you can do it or not. Is that clear, that this is the weak form of the problem? No. What is Yes? OK. <laughs> Good. So that is the weak form of the problem. So the weak form is find u such that that equation holds for all test functions v. And which is the finite element approximation? Very easy. We construct a finite element in space wh. And we seek uh, uh in that space such that the same problem holds, but for all test functions in the finite element space. OK? And that doesn't work. We know. For different reasons. There might be different reasons. The, uh, first, we know that if, generally speaking, generally speaking, that term, the convective term, dominates that one, hmm, in a certain sense, the method fails because it's convection dominated. If this is a small, that fails. But also, even if this is large and this is large, if this is degenerate and that poses some conditions on the components on, of u, that also doesn't work. So there are many reasons why, or I mean, this, at least these two reasons why it doesn't work. OK, that method, method doesn't work. So what to do if it doesn't work? That's the idea of the so-called variational multiscale method that uh, I'm going to explain now. The, the, uh, the subgrid scale concept, if you want. Now, now the name that has become popular is variational multiscale. The idea is very simple. The idea is very simple. The idea is that. Let's write the original equation. This equation, the original equation, let's write it as follows. We split the continuous space, W, into the finite element part, WH, with the boundary conditions, plus the rest, whatever the rest is. For the moment, I don't mind about the rest. So, and this is a direct sum. That means that uh, vectors in W, or functions in W, are the sum of functions in WH0 plus functions in W tilde. And the only function that belongs to both the spaces is 0. So that's why it is a direct sum. Okay? Now, I can do that splitting for the unknown and for the test function. So if that equation, the original one, has to hold for all, all test functions, it, held, it has to hold First, for test functions belonging to the finite element space, and then for functions belonging to the complement. Okay? If it holds for, func for all functions in the finite element space and for all functions in the complement, 
it will hold for all functions in the total space. Is that clear? It's like doing, if I have a vector with two components, I first impose uh, one component, the other zero, and then the other, and the first zero. Is that clear? Okay. Easy. It seems easy, right? And we do the same splitting for the unknown. So the unknown u, since the, the b is a bilinear form, um, I can split u into uh plus u tilde and uh, have these two terms. And likewise, when I test against the h. Do you all understand, because this is absolutely crucial, do you all understand that this equation is exactly the same as this one? Exactly the same. No difference. That's exact. No approximation. No nothing. We have just split the unknown, let's say, without knowing what is w tilde, okay? We don't know what w tilde is. We have no idea. It's just the complement, uh, any complement, in fact, that direct sum, of course, is not unique. That direct sum, obviously, is not unique. You can split one space into the sum of two spaces in many, many ways, okay? In many, many ways. For example, <coughs> R2, R2 is, can be equal to... I don't know, can be equal to this space plus this space. Okay? This is R2. Or R2 could be equal to this space plus this space. Okay? There are many options. So the complement can be chosen, that W tilde can be chosen in many ways. Okay? Can be chosen in many ways. W tilde can be chosen in many ways. Okay, we will call, of course, uh, WH is the finite element of space, and we will call W tilde the space of subgrid scales or simply subscales. Why? Because in the applications, we will understand the components that live here as those that cannot be captured by the finite element method, by the finite element approximation. Okay? So we have what can be reproduced, what can be captured by the finite element approximation plus the remainder, the, the rest, what is left. Okay? Good. If you compare the Galerkin method and this, you clearly see what? You clearly see that the Galerkin method can be defined as taking the subscales equal to what? To what? Zero. <laughs> the Galerkin method can be defined as a method in which these subscales are approximated by zero. You simply don't take into account what the finite element of space cannot reproduce. That's it. That's the Galerkin method. So so not, what is the idea of the methods that uh, we will see? The idea of the methods, it's not a method. It's a family of methods. In fact, it's a framework. That's uh, why I call it here a general framework. The idea of this framework is to approximate somehow u tilde. Anything you do will hopefully be better than zero. <laughs> you know, anything you, ca you do will hopefully be better than taking u tilde equal to zero. Okay? In principle... That is, that is the hope. That is the hope. Okay. So, let's see. Let's see how we play with that. So, we have the black ter th this Galerkin term and this, uh, this subgrid scale term. Now, we use that notation. The integral over the elements is denoted as the integral over omega prime. As the summation for all elements of the integral over the element is denoted as omega, and the integral of omega prime. So, this is element-wise integral. And likewise, the integral over boundary omega prime is the integral over the boundary of the elements uh, and summed for all elements. Okay. Good. Let's see. We have here two terms that we are going to analyze. One is this one, and the other is this one. So what is that? What is that? This term can be, and now the idea is the following. There is another idea that is important. Uh, to keep in mind here. We will try, in all what follows, we will try to approximate u tilde. To approximate u tilde. That's, that's the idea. The idea is that, of course, this is what the finite element method cannot capture. That's what the finite element method cannot capture. And we are, we are, gonna, we are not going to be able to obtain that exactly, of course, because that would amount to solve the original continuous equation. And that's impossible. Okay? So, pardon me? No, no, not the, this one and the, and the original one. For me? Oh, 
uh, sorry, because, yeah, sorry, that, that should be, uh, oh, that should be W naught. Sorry about that. I mean, they, sorry, there is a confusion here. Yes, you are right. You are right. Forget about the boundary conditions, because that, that was not the point. You are right. So, the idea is, we have B of U V equal to L of V. Okay? And B belongs to um, W, let's say, not. W not and U, well you can see it. U belongs to W not. Okay, so we split, we split uh, U into U H plus U tilde, and that belongs to W not H, the finite element space, and that belongs to the complement that also has to satisfy the boundary conditions. So W not should be equal to the direct sum of those two spaces. Okay, so and now we take the test function first in this space, first in this space. So that leads to b of u v h equal to l of v h, and then we take the test function in this space, which leads to b of u b tilde equals to l of b tilde. Okay, and then we split u into <coughs> u h plus u tilde. Okay. Good. So, um, now let's play with, um, with this term. Let's play with this term. Remember the expression here. There is a general concept that you have to keep in mind. That, that's what I was saying. We will not be able to obtain a closed, uh, an exact expression for the tilde, of course. The total complement of what? The orthogonal complement is zero? No, that's what I do. In fact, that's my method. But uh, but it's not uh, not zero at all. Yes. Yes. The Which one? Why will it be zero? Which one? That will be zero? No, not at all. Yes, the H belongs to WH naught, and that belongs to the compl orthogonal complement. But this is not the L2 product. That is the bilinear form of the problem. That is not. Uh, if this were. <coughs> For example, what, when you are saying that, what would be zero is this term, yes. only this one. You see why? Because it, it, that belongs that belongs to the finite element of space. Of course, S of U that also belongs to the finite element of space, and then that is zero if you take V tilde orthogonal to the finite element of space. So, in the method you are saying, which is, by the way, the method that I proposed, is that is zero, but not the rest of terms. Okay. Okay, so um, we have we have this term. So I was saying, <laughs> I was oof, I was saying that um, we are going only to approximate u tilde, and to approximate u tilde means that uh, we will try to capture the effect of u tilde on the finite element solution. Okay, so this is the term that we need to approximate. We will not get a good approximate, a, 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 a perfect, an exact approximation of u tilde, but just a, a, a just a global one. And since we are only want to get a global solution of U tilde, we will approximate U tilde, but we cannot approximate the derivatives of U tilde. So this is very important. The derivatives of U tilde are not going to be precise. Okay? So what we will do is we will try to isolate U tilde without computing derivatives of it. That's the idea. Isolate it without derivatives and try to obtain an expression for it. So that's what we will do, to, to obtain u tilde and not the derivatives of u tilde. And therefore, in that term, we will integrate by parts. And if we integrate by parts, what we will get is that. What do we get? <coughs> well, 
you know that uh, the definition you know the definition of the adjoint you know what the adjoint is okay the adjoint of an operator a a if you have an operator a and you apply it to a, a fun, a, 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 an a, an object and a vector x and you take the scalar product with i by definition the adjoint is the operator that makes this equality hold true okay that's the adjoint okay in the case of uh, of uh, real matrices this is nothing but the transpose in the case of real matrices in the case of complex matrices is the transpose and, and conjugate okay but that's the definition of the adjoint operator that's the definition of the adjoint operator. So which is the adjoint of the different terms that appear here? For example, which is the adjoint? In our case, L of u is, let me write it this way, minus the A k i j d j of u plus d i a i of u plus s of u. Okay? This is the differential operator that we have. The differential operator that we have. Summing for j and summing for k. Okay? summing from one to the number of space dimensions. So, for example, let's take, consider the adjoint of this term, which is the adjoint of the zero order term. The adjoint of the zero order term will be an operator such that this holds true. Okay? And so, in the case this is an, a, a matrix, what is S star? What? The transpose. A star is the transpose. Okay? okay so a star is that. Let's consider the convective term. For the convective term, what is the adjoint? What is the adjoint? So the derivative affects everything. So now we have to integrate by parts. If we integrate by parts, what we will have is the following. We will have the minus a i u derivative i of b okay plus the boundary term which is going to be n i a i u v okay you follow and that can be written as minus u comma if i want to move that to the right hand side i have to go with the transpose Okay, so this is going to be, so we will have a boundary term, but apart from the boundary term, about, apart from the boundary term, if we consider the, that the convective operator, the adjoint of the convective operator is minus the convective operator applied to the test function and with a transpose here. Have you all followed? And finally, what is the adjoint of the viscous term? So here we have to integrate by parts twice. And to integrate by parts twice, in the first case we have in the first case we have di k uh, excuse me kij dj of u di of v plus boundary terms that I won't consider, and then that will be equal to minus and then First, I put the derivative, I put, excuse me, the matrix here with a transpose, and then I take the derivative here. So that will be u, comma, uh, d, dj, k, ij, transpose, di of v, plus boundary terms. Have you seen that? No? You don't follow this? Yes? Okay. Well, <coughs> so, perfect. So, now what we do is to integrate by parts. If we integrate by parts, the, the, this term, remembering that it is given here with u equal to u tilde and v equal to vh, what we get is this expression. A boundary term, for the moment, don't care about, about the boundary term. And then we have the trend, what, what we will call the adjoint of the operator L applied to the test function. And that adjoint is, look here, the zero order term simply goes with the transpose. That's what we got here. The zero order term goes with the transpose. 
the first order term goes with a change of sign. This is very important. Goes with a change of sign. Matrices A are transposed. Matrices A and transposed, and then the derivative of the test function. And the second order term keeps the sign. We had the minus here, and we have a minus here because we have integrated by parts twice. Then we have um, matrix uh, K i j transposed, and then the derivative with respect to j. Here I said K i j. Uh, 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 yes. If you see the derivatives are uh, interchanged, it happens that in order to have a well-posed problem, this k i j has to be equal to k j i. Mm, that's uh, we need to have symmetry. That's why I have already used that here. Anyway, that is what we will call the adjoint of the convection diffusion reaction operator in matrix form. Okay. So that comes from the integration by parts of this term. And for the moment, forget about about the under the terms for the moment. And then what about that one? That is the equation for the subgrid scales. So uh, again, we integrate that by parts, and we will get th that equation after integration by parts. You see, this is essentially where we, we have uh, come from. We have come from that equation. Look, L of u tilde, move that to the left-hand side, L of u tilde plus L of u h equal to f. That was the original equation. And that has been tested against the, uh, the subgrid scale test function, you see? And then we have a boundary term, a boundary term that comes from the fact that we are dealing with the weak form of the problem. Okay, weak form of the problem. So, <clears throat> that is the idea. That this is still exact. No approximation. That's exact. If we were able to compute u tilde and u h, that would be the exact solution. Okay, so now it comes uh, the, uh, the different methods. Now it comes different methods. First of all, it can be shown that for the continuous solution to be well posed, the diffusive fluxes must be continuous across interelement boundaries. What does it mean? This, this you see, is the diffusive is the diffusive flux, the diffusive flux of the continuous solution because this is U H plus U tilde, so this is U, okay? This is U, and this is the diffusive flux, and you see that is integrated over all the element boundaries. So in one element we have one normal, and in the neighbor element we have the opposite normal. And it happens that the diffusive fluxes have to be continuous to have a well-posed problem. This is a property of second-order differential equations. Okay? You know that, for example, for the Poisson problem, the normal derivative across any surface has to be continuous. You know, this is a property of second-order differential operators. So that has to be continuous. So that term has to vanish exactly. So this is exactly zero. Okay? That term is exactly zero. That's what it says here. The diffusive fluxes must be continuous across interelement boundaries. The second equation, and then the second equation is equivalent to what? Since this term is equivalent, to, is exactly zero, that term essentially says that L of u h plus L of u tilde, which is L of u, has to be equal to f in the space orthogonal to the subgrid scales. So that is what is said here. In the space of to orthogonal to the subgrid scales, L of u tilde plus L of u h is equal to f wherever the subgrid scales are. We still don't know them. That is exactly true. And of course, we have a boundary condition which we don't know, which is that u tilde has to be equal to a certain uh, skeleton value, is called a certain value on the boundary, because uh, I, have, is, I have written these equations element by element, because remember that this is the integral within each element. That's why I have written that element wise. That's the integral within each element. Okay, so we are done. What is the idea now? The idea is, okay, that equation is exactly equivalent to this one. And if we were able to solve this equation, we could replace the expression of u tilde here. Now, it, we don't have derivatives, you see. Through this integration by parts, we don't have derivatives anymore. That's why we have done that. So we could replace u tilde here. And once we, you have, we have u tilde here, what do we get? We get a problem posed in terms of u h alone. Why? Because here we should be able to obtain u tilde in terms of u h. Okay. Here we will get u tilde in terms of u h, and once we have it, we plug it in the first equation, and we get an equation for u h. That's what we want: an equation for the finite element unknown. Okay. That's what the, we are looking for: an equation for the finite element unknown. So that's what we will do. We should, but now it's completely open. 
I mean, this is a framework, as I said. First, how do you choose the space of subgrid scales? How do you choose that space W tilde? Once you have chosen that space W tilde, you have that orthogonal complement. So to choose that orthogonal complement is exactly equivalent to choose the space of subgrid scales. Second, how do you approximate the value of U tilde on the skeleton of the, of the mesh, so the element boundaries? And most importantly, how do you solve for U tilde? So how do you solve this equation? This is as difficult as the original one. Okay? And once you have that, uh, you move to the first equation, to that equation, and then you get the problem for UH alone. In the following, I think uh, uh, we will stop here, but in the following, what we will do is to assume that that is equal to zero, that is equal to zero, and that the skeleton of U tilde is equal to zero. What does that mean? What does these two, those are two simplifying assumptions that can be relaxed. Those are simplifying assumptions just to lead to uh, common stabilized methods, you know. But what does this assumption mean, that the H orthogonal is equal to zero? Essentially, it means that, is essentially, uh, this is equal to zero, it means that the space of subscales is essentially the space of finite element residuals. We will see that later in more detail. And what does that mean that you, on the skeleton of U tilde is zero? That U is what? We have, we have introduced the concept uh, a few minutes ago. U tilde is what? What type of function? A bubble function, exactly. U tilde is made of bubble functions, excellent. So we are going to assume that U tilde is made of bubble functions and that the space of subscales is the space of residuals, okay? So now with these two approximations that can be relaxed or can be changed if you want, think of that the way you wish, uh, with these two approximations we will see that we are able, from this general framework, we are able to recover, um, once we insert U tilde here, we are able to recover the method, something similar to the methods that we have seen so far, okay? We'll see this this afternoon. I thought that that would take me, would take me less than three sessions, but it's going to take me a little more. Anyway, the rest is, go, is going to be much faster, okay? So I'll see you this afternoon. Sorry again for the delay. <laughs>